Before we start to talk a little bit more specifically of the actual Civil War, it's important to take a moment to talk about the 1858, same difference, right? 1858 Lincoln Douglas debates. And we aren't going to delve too deeply into this, except to note the, the, the incredible transformative power that these debates had. The debates were held in seven different cities, and the format of the debate was that the first speaker, and it flipped from debate to debate, would speak for an hour. The second speaker would speak for an hour and a half, and the third speaker would speak for another half hour. Despite three hours of continuous rhetoric, these debates were incredibly popular. Often there were thousands of people at each of these venues, and as you can see, it covers the state of Illinois, and many of these are very small places. Even, uh, even back in eight, uh, 1858, before there was a kind of homogenization around the cities. These are important to note because the, the remnants of the abolitionist rhetoric are at the heart of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, with Douglas and Lincoln really debating over what is the essential function of the government in terms of abolition. And both, uh, Lincoln, uh, both Lincoln and Jefferson Davis, who I'm going to talk about in a moment, despise Douglas's position. And so they become, that's a common enemy for both of them. But also important is the fact that both of the major Chicago newspapers committed to coverage of these events, which increased their popularity. And the entire transcript of every single debate was published soon after the debate happened. So although these debates were held all over the state, the message of the debates were, was uh, transmitted in a way that created circulation of these ideas, and these ideas are going to be recirculated both in Douglas's and in Jefferson Davis's rhetoric. So let's take a moment and talk about what are people seeing as the arguments of the time leading up to the Civil War, and especially to the, to the succession. So as I mentioned before, the art of editorial cartooning is relatively new in the 1860s, and it had to do with the change in technology in printing newspapers. Uh, before the 1860s, if you wanted to have some kind of illustration in the paper, it had to be pen and ink. And then the technologies changed so that wood blocks could be cut. And as a result, editorial cartoons create, got a lot more rich and a lot more detailed. Because of their, their, uh, their novelty, they also got a lot of attention. And in fact, several newspapers and magazines became quite famous for having and hiring uh, political cartoonists, especially uh, Harper's, which we'll talk about in a little while. So I wanted to, to walk you through a few of these images because they're really intriguing. And they really get to kind of the, the consensus of the exigence, or what are the expectations and how are people being uh, brought into a sense of the outrage of the war. The first image you'll see is Lincoln as king, and as we talk about in just a few minutes, one of the key elements of the Civil War rhetoric, especially on the Confederacy side, is what is the role of the revolution, and how, well, how do we justify uh, the succession? The next set of images are from a Confederate um, artist, um, Johann, who happens to be German, Johann Vogel. Uh, the first one is actually of um, Lincoln writing the Emancipation Proclamation. You'll notice that he has horns and he's stepping on the Constitution as he's writing this. I'm going to let Sam talk about the next one because it is near and dear to his heart. <laughs> I have a brother-in-law who's a, a, a Kansas graduate, and as anyone from Kansas or Missouri will tell you that there is a bitter, bitter rivalry between the schools, but this goes beyond mascots and closely contested football games. <laughs> the, the, the rivalry between Kansas and Missouri was literally fought over their border, and this particular uh, cartoon you can see that a, a confederate artist has shown a marauding Kansas Jayhawker who has abducted a woman who is kind of hard to see, but she's burying her breast. Uh, they're pillaging this particular farm and uh, destroying property. The historical record indicates that this did happen, that folks from Kansas were um, 
not only concerned about the border and about you know where they where it was contested, but also the fact that Missouri was the northernmost slave-owning state. It was a border state, and that really really bothered a lot of folks in Kansas. And so they literally took up arms <laughs> against Missourians, crossed the border, and in many cases would go into villages and not only pillage them but kill people as a result of this. And so when people talk about the Kansas-Missouri basketball or football rivalry, it really, really, really goes deep. Uh, and again, because Missouri being, at least in part, uh, one of the northernmost slave owned states. Thanks. I want to, there's two more images from the same cartoons that follow the same theme. In both of those, you can see that the uh, northern armies, the Union armies, are uh, essentially raping and pillaging, creating a sense of fear. And this sense of fear and the sense of kind of outrage is going to be reproduced in the rhetoric, especially of uh, Jefferson Davis's, I'm going to call it his second inaugural, but it's technically his first inaugural, but I'll talk about that in a second. These next two images actually happened uh, during the election of 1860, um, and they both kind of illustrate some of the difficulties that Lincoln was facing, uh, first from the Copperheads, who were the um, uh, Democrats who were primarily Midwestern, who really weren't as engaged in the abolitionist movement and were really looking for peace, primarily because of the, where they were situated in, in terms of needing trade. Um, the second image has to do with kind of uh, with Lincoln attaching himself to slavery as his primary issue. I want to show you a series of uh, northern cartoons about Jefferson Davis. So the first one, the one that's up to the, if you're facing it, the right, is entitled Christmas Morning Down South. And it's Jefferson Davis awaking to a hangman, um, just terrified of the, um, what's going to happen. The other image is John Bull, who is the, represent, the visual representation of England in the conflict. So the sense that the South is trying really hard and making promises to the English. Then finally, this is a beautiful one, the proper family reunion. Uh, it's Benedict Arnold and the devil serving, uh, uh, mixing the treason bucket. So you can see that there's this vitriol in the cartoons that not only gives you kind of the themes that emerge in the rhetoric, but also set the stage for what the folks who are creating these addresses have to, to deal with. Because as Sam alluded to earlier, every public address is done in terms of audience. And it's not simply in the case of these folks, the audience who are present <coughs> at the moment that the speech is given, but there are audiences transmitted through the, the papers and as I talk about Jefferson Davis, who I might as well go ahead and have this image up right now, uh, Davis is very thoughtful about not only talking to the Confederacy, but also addressing the United States Congress. And so he is, he's walking a, a tightrope in his public address because he has to engage the audience of believers and also he has to think about the external audiences, not only of the North who are listening to his rhetoric and, and in the first inaugural address trying to decide if this is something, if, if this secession thing can work, but he's also looking at foreign audiences and I'm going to talk about that in a second. So quickly, just a background on Jefferson Davis. Um, as you can see from this slide, he's got a very strong military background and in fact, when Jefferson Davis was, he wasn't originally elected, he was appointed the first president of the South. He didn't really want that. He really wanted to have a battle uh, position. He wanted to lead an army. And so he was, his, his background was military, including serving as Secretary of War in the 1850s. And he did so with, con with, with high praise. And so he had a, an exceptional reputation as a military commander. So for him to make the move to a presidential leader was very difficult. Um, although he was certainly somebody that early in his presidency had almost, in, had almost universal support. And the newspaper articles of the, that, that covered his first and his other first inaugural address um, just laud him and talk about what a wonderful leader he was, as opposed to the Northern Papers, which we'll talk about in a minute. 
So for the, for the next 10 minutes or so, I want to talk about Jefferson Davis's first inaugural address in 1861 in Mississippi, and then what's called his second inaugural address, but was actually his first actual inaugural address, which happened in, uh, in Virginia in 1862. So let's start with his first inaugural address. So um, Davis's first inaugural address is the one that probably people are most familiar with it. And in it, he's laying out the foundations of the Confederacy. And he's, again, he's communicating to the broader audience and especially to international audiences that this is a legitimate government and one that needs to be taken seriously. But to do this, he makes three sets of pleas. The first sets of pleas, the first set is actually about himself as a leader. And his theme in this first set is essentially, I'm not worthy, but. And it's that reluctant leadership, that sense of, I am a, a, a human being, and I'm going to make mistakes. So early in the speech, he talks about being called to the difficult and responsible station of chief magistrate. In the first inaugural address, this is his only allusion to the divine or to the spiritual. So the rest of the speech is almost entirely based on themes of patriotism. But his second plea, or his second plea, is at the very end of the address. And it's really interesting because he starts with, you see, you will see many errors, many deficiencies to tolerate, but you shall not find me either want of zeal or fidelity to the cause. That is, to, to me, the highest of in hope and most enduring affection. Your generosity has bestowed upon me an undisturbed, undeserved distinction, one which I neither sought nor desired. Upon the continuance of that sentiment, and upon your wisdom and patriotism, I rely to direct and support me in the performance and duties of my required hand. This is not the, the speech of a strong leader. This is not the speech of somebody who feels confident. Yet, as we look at the second set of appeals, and that has to do with the righteousness of the Southern Secession based on the historical documents of the United States, the appeals get much stronger. Most of the speech is based on appeals to the Declaration of Independence and to the Constitution. And essentially what, what uh, Davis is trying to argue is that if you follow the logic of the Founding Fathers and the documents of the Founding Fathers, what's happened in the South was essentially a done deal. They had no choice based on how the North was treating them. So you'll notice that I've um, highlighted here the, the actual um, reference to the Declaration of Independence. And in a second, he talks a little bit about the, um, the Bill of Rights. And so there's very specific appeals based on what he sees as, essential, as, the, um, as the, the rights of states when they see a government that's not fitting in their own needs to be able to create a new government. There's one more set of appeals, and that has to do with the inevitability of war. And this is an interesting moment, because this is really the only part of this speech where he actually talks about war. And remember, we're talking about a military leader. Essentially, what he's arguing is that they want peace. They, want, they don't want to see a war. And, and at this point in 1861, not only is war inevitable, but battles are already springing up. So to have that kind of sense of the, the key to this is we, if, if we're brought into war, we are going to fight it, we're going to raise an army, and we're going to do it right. But there's no war cry. There's no you would cry that says, you know, we've got to arm and we've got to get it together. So this first inaugural is, is almost a volume to the North and to the uh, external nations, especially in Europe, well, all, all in Europe, to say, look, we have a strong economy. We have what you need, and I've left out that part of the appeal, and so really you need to be a trade partner with us. And so it's much less about rallying the southern troops outside of this patriotism, which is we did what was right based on our founding principles, and much more, and, and much less kind of a let's join together in war. The New York Times savaged this speech. The reaction was almost immediate, and it was just Horrific. You'll notice that they say, 
Uh, and they compared to Davis's farewell speech in the Senate, and that actually brings up one more thing. He never mentioned slavery in the speech. And as the New York Times says, he doesn't even allude to it. So it's all states' rights. It's all about you know, the need to, to work together. Um, but what I thought was really interesting was the very last comment that the Supreme Court, or the Supreme Court, that the New York Times made. The lackluster, shop-worn rhetoric of Davis and other leaders was not merely a failure of aesthetics, but proof of the intellectual poverty and moral laziness undergirding their entire enterprise. So the Southern reception was, of course, much better. And what's interesting is the Southern newspapers, and unfortunately I couldn't grab images to put up here, the Southern newspapers tended to report more on the pageantry and the idea that there were all these grand people. And by the way, 5,000 people saw the Mississippi speech. So this is a, a large amount of people who came. And on the way from the train, he, the David, Jefferson Davis was bombarded by people from when he got to town in Jackson, Mississippi, all the way to when he delivered the speech. 